is joining us today. Um, my name is Courtney Kirshner. I'm an enrollment concierge team lead with LSU Online. And today joining us, we have Jesse Downs, who's the director with the Olang Career Center. So Jesse. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. And um, just a brief overview of the Olin Career Center. The Olin Career Center is the centralized career services function for the LSU campus, serving both um, students that are on um, the physical campus, but also LSU online students as well. Uh, we serve all students, all majors, all classifications through um, all realms of the career development process. So everything from how do I even decide what I want to maybe major in or what career I want to uh, work towards to um, building work experience, developing skills, um, learning how to articulate those skills, and then connecting with employers for employment after the fact or graduate school. So um, today, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say real quick, um, as we go through this, um, everybody who's joining us today, if you guys do have a question along the way, we will kind of be stopping and um, answering some questions. So feel free to put anything in like the question and answer section. And I'll kind of be moderating and kind of like jump in here and there if we have some questions. So feel free along the way to ask some questions. Well, we're excited today to talk about resume development, particularly um, um, in regards to career changers or people looking for new opportunities. And so the basics that we're going to cover today are purpose. What's the purpose of the resume? The perspective the strategy for an effective resume, and then finally, finesse. So to get us started, um, I just have a question for everybody, and that's basically what is the purpose of the resume? So if in the chat you'll humor me and provide your answer to this poll question, we'll see what everybody thinks. Ooh, if you did D, Give us what your other is. I mean, E, sorry. There's a strong um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> all. So, so I think um, it's important to know that depending on what you're using the resume for will determine what the purpose is, right? And so if you're a presenter at a conference and um, they want to know um, everything about you, then maybe it is a chronological um, description of everything you've ever done. Um, if you're applying for a job, then it probably is um, to convince that hiring manager to move you to the interview process, if that's the next step. Um, maybe it's just to pass the um, computer screen, right, to get to human eyes, to look at that interview. Generally, resume is part of the expected process, and so the answer really is all of the above, right? It could be all of those things, but it also could be other things. So the purpose, it's really important that you think about what is the purpose of this document that I'm creating? Like, why am I updating this purpose every time I send it to someone? Um, and that's really what we want to talk about when we talk about perspective. And so when you're updating or recreating or creating a resume for the first time, the most important thing that you can think about is who is the reader, right? If I'm applying for jobs, then likely the reader is going to be the recruiter, the first line hiring manager. It may be even an applicant tracking software initially that's looking at that document for keywords in order to pass it through a process. And when you think about the perspective, not only who the reader is, but what does the reader need to know? What does the reader need to know to make a decision to uh, accomplish the task? Um, and in order to know what they need to know, we really kind of need to know what do they care about? So not only what is crucial for them to know, but what are the things that would be helpful to them? What are the things that they care about? What are the things that align with their goals? And so when thinking, especially about creating a resume for the purpose of job searching, 
Um, you, instead of thinking about why am I writing a resume, you need to think about why does the reader or what does the reader need out of this resume? Because the resume is really not for you as a candidate. It's really for the hiring manager, the employer, the recruiter to understand you as a candidate. So the reader is the most important perspective to consider when crafting a resume. And so how do we understand that, right? How do we um, know who the reader is and what they care about? Well, there's a lot of tools to help us get there. And the first and most obvious tool is the job listing. So I went on to LSU's HRM website and just pulled a job description. And you'll see this is a job posting for an admissions counselor. And in it, LSU does a pretty good job of detailing its hyperlink. So when we send this out, you could click on it and read the whole thing. Um, it, they give a, a good job of very explicitly stating what the duties of this role will be, what the qualifications expected, the skills necessary. And so really, this is the key for us to understand the reader. What, if, if a hiring manager is doing a good job, then in the job posting, they will very explicitly tell you what they need and what they care about. And so as an applicant, the first and most important thing that we tell um, job seekers is to go ahead and print that job description or download it and, and read through it and highlight or circle those little snippets of information that um, you feel like you've done before or you have some related experience to the things that you identify with and that's where you'll start to understand the parts of the job description that you match so after we've looked at the job description we can also do some more investigating um, through the company website but also linkedin to um, evaluate and try to get a perspective about the company and the position so I use LinkedIn all the time and in the search bar at the top um, of LinkedIn, if you search Louisiana State University, it'll take you to this LSU LinkedIn um, page. And in it, if you click alumni on the left hand bar, then I'll pull up all of the LSU alums with LinkedIn profiles. And so I just did a quick search in the LSU LinkedIn database for the title admissions counselor. And so I now can look at the 311 alumni who've in some way or another been an admissions counselor at LSU to learn about what are the skills they have? What, how do they describe their job and their profiles? Is there any other clues that I can understand to get a better perspective and point of view of the reader by looking at former or current employees? So the company website, which I didn't pick a company website, but from a company website, you could also understand the company's values, um, their key products or services. Um, sometimes there's statements about vision and mission. And so those are all key tools to understand um, the reader's point of view, what the reader cares about, what they need. And then the next step is figuring out how you fit there. Additionally, we know through research that any employer that's looking to hire generally is looking for eight career competencies. So no matter if you're in medical physics, construction management, or copywriting, um, employers are looking for these basic skills with all jobs, critical thinking and problem solving, oral and written communication, teamwork and collaboration, digital technology, leadership, work ethic and professionalism, career management, and then global and intercultural fluency. And so, although it may not be explicit in the job posting, in some ways it will be. These are the basic skill sets that, if nothing else, you're looking to demonstrate in your resume. So those are some things to consider when thinking about what is the reader look for in my resume? So let's talk about strategy. To me, the first step 
in um, job searching is to create what I would call a toolbox document. And let me see if I can pull this up. Oh, it's not going to work. Um, so a toolbox document is what I would say is the list of everything you've ever done since you name it, right? So for me, it would probably be from my college years. So that was 20 years ago. And so I would have all every resume, all the information from all resumes um, detailed in a single document. Now, this is not anything I would ever send out to anyone, but I've done all the work on the front end. I have all the tools, my experiences and skills that I've amassed over 20 years, um, and it's all written out. And so that I can determine which tools in my toolbox I'm going to use in the future. Now, most of the things from the early 2000s that I did as an undergraduate in college, I never actually put on a document that I send out these days. But perhaps I'll need it. And so I keep it there and it's no harm, no foul, right? So the toolbox. Um, yeah. The toolbox. We, oh, yeah, I was going to say, question. Jesse, we we do have a question um right. so within that toolbox and that stuff um and the previous slide is that mm -hmm. as far as those critical skills is that something that you want to add to a resume sure i think we want to demonstrate those skills so awesome. we'll um we'll look at a sample in a minute and generally um a resume reader wants to see proof of a skill so if you say uh, I have um, strong oral and written communication skills. Okay, but can you prove it? So a, a resume bullet that says develop strong written communication skills doesn't give us much, right? That's just you saying what you need to say. But if you demonstrated your strong written communication skills by talking about how you drafted copy for company-wide emails that were distributed to, you know, 2,000 employees, well, that demonstrates your written communication skill. And so um, there may be a need for a skill-specific question, but for the most part, we demonstrate skills in the way that we describe our experiences. And I'll go into detail about that um, when we get to the example. Thanks. So the toolbox is, um, is, is all about doing all the work on the front end, right? Purging information, um, getting everything out, talking about every experience way more than you probably ever would to just get the information out on a document so that you can use it in the future. The second phase um, of crafting a resume for a job search would be that you would then research the position in the organization and then you would edit that document, your toolbox, and refine it down to a resume that you would want to send that's specifically tailored to that position. So if I was applying for that admissions counselor position and I'd done my research about the job description and I highlighted those examples in the job description that I felt connected with, then I would want to go back to my resume and compare it against that highlighted job description, right? If I highlighted things in the job description that I think are a match, but they're not demonstrated in the resume, then that's a missed opportunity. So I want to go back and really tailor the document, edit the things that um, are maybe too old and irrelevant. Um, Maybe in my current job, I have in my toolbox resume 20 bullet points, but only eight of them are really um, relevant to this admissions counselor's job. So I would I'd pare those down and I would start to refine to really make a match between what the job is looking for and the skills and experiences that I've had over the course of my um, career. And that refinement, you know, could take a little bit of time, especially if you have a long toolbox. You know, for me, um, if I was applying for a job right now, you know, everything after or grad school and before probably comes off of that um, in terms of experiences. Um, and then the different experiences I've had since then, 
uh, begin to manipulate? Do I need to give a lot of detail or a little detail? What's important and what's not important? You don't ever really want to leave out gaps of information because then the reader might perceive that, you know, you had gaps of unemployment. Um, and so, but it is okay just to have a title line of an experience to show, yeah, I worked at this job for two years. It's really not relevant to our conversation, but I just want to show you my work history. So once you've refined, and we'll talk about kind of the rules about a resume, that toolbox down to a one or a two page document that's really tailored, demonstrates how you're a good fit for this particular job, then the phase three is like the extra. So um, the why, why do you want the job? Why are you interested in maybe this career change or this organization? And a lot of times there's not a way to provide the why on a resume. So we might do that through a cover letter. And that allows you a little bit of narrative to tell the story, tell the why. And then we always like to close the loop by networking. So once your resume is looking great, um, then Let's figure out, do you know somebody that works in that organization? Can you find someone through LinkedIn that may have a mutual connection? And so that you can pass your resume through your network to enhance the likelihood that the hiring manager or the recruiter sees it as well. So it's not about just sending an application in, but it's figuring out how to kind of wrap around that application with um, a cover letter and networking um, to ensure that it gets into the right hands. So we do have a question. Um, <clears throat> somebody asked, so if we have past experiences and past jobs that we do not feel really benefit the sought after position, do we need to include that job and just take off the detail or do we just leave the job off completely? Um, I think that would depend on the situation. So, um, Let's say that it was your first job and it was 35 years ago. Well, we don't, you don't have to go that far back. Usually 10 years is about um, standard. Um, but what, um, let's say it was a job that you had three years ago and it was a job in between a, a stint of two related opportunities. Well, that's where I would leave just the title and not give any detail. The other thing to think about is um, while jobs may not be related um, or maybe we don't think they're beneficial, we do generally develop transferable basic career readiness skills in every job. And so it may just be thinking differently about that job, right? That seems inconsequential because did you work on a team? Did you solve problems? Did you help a customer? Did you deal with technology? And so there may be some things um, that are below the surface that do prove skill sets that are valuable. Um, but it would be okay to not give a description um, if, if you didn't feel that it merited the landscape or the real estate on the page. All right, so Next, we'll talk a little bit about finesse. So um, people get real wrapped up in resume in terms of formatting and for good reason, right? Um, there are countless applicants to every single job and a recruiter or hiring manager really doesn't have the time to um, read through those resumes um, with the attention and the detail that we would all as potential applicants hope. And so the formatting, having a clear, well-organized, professionally formatted document helps the reader to get through that document quickly and figure out the most important information. So some rules to kind of live by. You want a font that is clean and clear. We um, generally recommend like a Times New Roman, Arial, Garamond is a smaller font that allows you to get more content on the page that's still pretty clean. Also, generally we wanna look for a one page resume if at all possible to maximum, but if it's two pages, then it's generally two full pages. So. We don't like one, one and a third page. 
if you're going into academia or higher ed, then those kind of rules go out of the out of the window in like hard science research when they want CVs, then we see, you know, um, assistant professors with 15 page resumes. So, but for a, you know, typical like job in industry or nonprofit, you know, one full page, two full page resumes is really what we're looking for. We want to make sure that, you know, it's, we don't really send hard copy resumes anymore, but that, you know, black font, white paper, um, that we're not using any emojis or clip art, no pictures on the resume. Um, we also want to avoid any sort of personal um, HR uh, dis prevented discriminatory information. So, you know, there are legal um, guidelines that prevent discrimination on age, race, gender, et cetera. Um, and so if we put those kind of, that information on a document, we open ourselves up for those things. So marital status, all of that um, can remain off of the resume. And then most importantly is that we wanna tailor the actual document for each job that we apply for. So because um, hiring managers get tons of resumes. I mean, we had a job opening in our office um, the other day and we got 150 applicants for an uh, entry level job in our office. And, and that's probably a smaller applicant pool than some, some jobs. Um, it was very obvious from flipping through these resumes, just 30 seconds each, who wanted the job or knew the strategy <laughs> to prove that they wanted the job by tailoring their document and writing a, a cover letter and who just wanted a job. And so you can make it really easy on the hiring manager um, by proving that match, by doing your research, by tailoring and manipulating to prove that match. Um, and that goes a long way. So let's look at some examples here. So you'll notice Joey Burrow is preparing for the job search. I highlighted Joey's um, contact information in the header, um, but generally he would have a phone number, an email address, and maybe a mailing address, but the mailing address is optional. If he had a LinkedIn handle that he wanted to provide there, that, that's where it would go as well. For Joey, Joey chose to do kind of a executive summary at the top. So you'll notice he um, has a heading, corporate and entrepreneurial executive sales leader, and then just highlights some general um, points that he thinks will be selling points of him as a candidate. He then identifies core competencies and Joey hopefully chose those points in the executive summary at the top or the core competencies based on the job description that he researched and the research on the organization and the company. And then you'll notice Joey lists his professional sales experience in reverse chronological order. So in any resume, we want to identify um, our experience section the entry should be in reverse chronological order, which means what we're doing now and working backwards. And then how we describe our experiences would be through action verb statements, quantifying and qualifying wherever possible. So you'll see that um, Joey decided to go with, you know, a paragraph format. You'll notice every statement starts with an action verb, not um, a personal pronoun and that he gives details, context, and then he pulls out some very quantifiable information to show his accomplishments. So maintained a 90% occupancy or better for nearly two years compared to 75% previously. So showing that result um, is really important. And so as we talked about the skills, right? Do you put these skills on your resume? You'll notice that Joey doesn't have a skill section, but he proves those skills by the way he's describing his experiences, right? 
he talks about um, the sales experiences that he has, the communications experience, the uh, customer satisfaction, the management experience, the relationship building. And so Joey goes on to describe each one of his past work experiences. And then he chose um, to include community involvement. So it's important to know that experience is not just paid experience. It could be things that you do in the community, volunteer, um, extracurricular leadership. Um, and so how you share your experiences is up to you. Um, he could have had a section that just said experience and it could have intermingled on the chronological order, but the paid and the unpaid experiences. Joey, because he graduated a while ago, chose to put his education at the bottom and that's a personal choice. Um, generally, if your education is pretty new, right, you complete your degree pretty recently, then you would put that at the top because it might be the most valuable asset that you have in the hiring process. But if you're an experienced hire, um, maybe you graduated 10 years ago and you've had 10 years of related work experience, well, that education um, can move to the bottom to really move your related experience to the top. So manipulating the document is all about thinking about what the reader is gonna care about. So if Joey was ap applying for an executive sales leader position, they probably care that Joey has been in sales for the last however many years more than the fact that he got a degree 15 years ago, right? They'll wanna make sure he got that degree because it's probably required for the job, but he doesn't have to lead with that because just having the degree doesn't qualify him for that um, experience position. So Jesse, do you have then one of the questions that was asked is do you recommend any specific templates that maybe like if somebody needed to start their application or their resume? Yeah. Um, after this presentation, when we send it out, I'll send a Word document template. Uh, we There's no one template that you know, meets the mark. We find that um, the downloadable templates in Microsoft Word um, are in chart forms, like hidden charts, and so they're hard to manipulate. So we prefer to just um, use a straight up Word document. Um, and you'll notice that this example on the screen looks a little bit different, right, than the um, sample right before. So Jerry Burrow, and Eddie Orgeron. So um, with Eddie, we, we are maximizing the width of the page much more than Joey did. Let me go back again, right? Um, the way we've used our headers, you know, he's got, um, Eddie has all the header information on the one line. So there are little things that you can do to manipulate the format to give more room to talk about the important content. So you'll see Eddie here, you know, he did a professional summary, but let out, left off the core competencies, no big deal. He chose to organize his experience based on his professional experience, then his military experience, um, and then his education and then military training, and then lists the community and professional involvement. So he didn't talk about his um, community involvement, um, but mention that just to show I'm involved in my community, I'm involved in professional associations, et cetera. Um, you'll see the same that applies for Eddie here is that Eddie starts each one of his bulleted statements with an action verb, describing and giving details, um, data, numbers, as much as possible and context about the accomplishments and what he's able to do. And so he's demonstrating those skills that every employer looks for through these action verb statements. And again, hopefully he went through the job description for the job that he applied for and maybe is manipulating some of those um, statements so that they really show a direct match. This doesn't, I don't mean lying or embellishing the truth. I mean, just, um, if in his toolbox for the first entry, he had eight more bullet points that he deleted the eight that were unnecessary. 
or maybe he um, when he read the job description it talked about reviewing contracts and contract supplements and subcontracts but in his initial resume he just said review contracts but when he read that job description he thought oh I did all of those things contract supplements well I need to add that because I can't I don't want the assumption the the reader to under assume or over assume what I did um, and so really going back to that job description and the research on the um, position and comparing it to your document is the key because that as a hiring manager is what you're using here's what you say you need right uh, uh, hiring manager when they post a job they're identifying their need and so as a candidate it's your job to show them how you can meet their need right because a hire is a business decision right i I have a need in my workforce to make money to accomplish my goal and I'm trying to find the best person to achieve that because the best person to achieve that maximizes um, our accomplishments and profitability and all of those different things and so this is a business decision when people are reviewing resumes how can I ensure the right fit the right person who has the right experiences um, because the right hire pays off in the end. So a couple of questions for you, Jesse. Um, sure. So somebody like this, um, I know that you talked about if you have all these years of experience and to put the education or it's a, it's a personal choice to put the education at the end. Sure. One of the questions is, what if I've recently gone back to school to get a graduate level degree, but I have five plus years of experience, would you say the education still stays at the bottom or should I put it at the top? Yeah, I feel like if you think the graduate degree um, increases your um, competitiveness, then I would add it to the top, right? So it's a um, it's a new credential, and you think if that's like that new credential um, is what's helping me achieve this goal, then uh, my career goal, then I'm going to put it at the top. And so really, you can choose either way, right? Um, but determining, right, like if I got a, let's just say my personal love is music theory. Well, and I'm getting a master's degree in music theory because I just love it, but I'm never going to have a job in music theory. And in fact, I'm applying for another job as a career center director somewhere else. Well, having music theory as the graduate degree at the top of my resume is of no value to anyone except for myself. And the resume is not for me, it's for the reader. And so I would Put that at the bottom but if I was applying to be uh, an associate vice president of a university and I was in the middle of my cor coursework for a PhD you better believe my education would jump up to the top because in, in higher education if you want an executive position at the university you better have that PhD and so um, and so that's that's where you start making those decisions right um, what is the reader going to care about the most? And then another question was for in the resume, do you put periods at the end of the bullet points or no? Um, I, it, it's really a personal preference. Um, the thing is consistency. So you'll notice in this resume example on our page, there's no period. I mean, it's not technically a sentence, right? Um, so no period, but no one, you're not going to get um, not hired because you have periods or don't have periods, but consistency is the key. Oh, look, this one has a period here. So, oh, sorry. Error on this one. So anyway, uh, yeah, up to you. Okay. Another question is, um, if you're not on, and this kind of goes back to LinkedIn, if you're not on LinkedIn or other social media platforms, is that a huge negative mark on you in the hiring process? Um, I'm not sure it's a negative mark. I guess it would depend actually, though, on what business you're going into, right? So if you wanted to be in HR, I think that, you know, a, LinkedIn is a tool that HR people use. And so if you're not on, on LinkedIn, then people would wonder like, hmm, why are you not using the tool that everyone uses? Um, but 
uh, not necessarily. What I think that LinkedIn does is um, it um, allows you an opportunity to build a professional network, which may prove to be really beneficial in the job search and your career development. And so um, as a job seeker, you may be missing out. LinkedIn um, companies also source LinkedIn for candidates. And so without a profile, um, companies are not able to source you. And um, now that's kind of a passive job search, right? Some people, I would never recommend like, just put your stuff on LinkedIn and somebody will reach out to you. Um, that's like a cherry on top of the Sunday, but it does happen, right? You have an active profile on LinkedIn, a company's looking for a certain skill set or experience. You haven't indicated any interest and someone reaches out to you and says, I found your profile. You look like a great fit. You know, can we interview you? And, you know, there would be, there could be opportunities presented that you would never know about um, otherwise. So, you know, um, public institutions like LSU have to post their jobs, um, but uh, broadly, but not everybody does that. So some, some organizations just recruit through network uh, methods. And so what, what opportunities um, are you not aware of um, could be a, a question to think about. But I don't know if a company looks at your looks for a LinkedIn profile and says, oh, they don't have one. What's wrong with them? You know, that's a personal choice. And then to kind of stay on the theme of LinkedIn, it was asked um, if you are listing things like LinkedIn or social media profiles on your resume, do you advise to include hyperlinks for convenience? Um, and then what about hyperlinks in general for things like your email address? Yeah, that, that would be fine. Um, a hyperlink is fine and lovely. Um, so yeah, for to especially if people are getting your document electronically that does make it quite quite easy so that's nice not again a, a personal choice um, I've never gone to a resume and thought like oh that candidate didn't hyperlink their email I'm devastated right so uh, uh, really the the content what you say about your experiences how you demonstrate your matches is really what I'm mostly looking at all right, and then another question that came through, Jesse, is how would you reference a company on your resume if you are part of a vendor slash contract team for them? Yeah, um, I think that you could um, write like the job title um, could either be the title. So like, let's say you're a contract accountant for someone. Um, so you could write you could list it like that contract accountant and you could list the agency that you're contracted through and um, you can then reference or um, might you say contract accountant with the company name that you're contracted to and then you could reference in maybe a uh, parentheses or something the the employer or the contracting agency if that makes sense or vice versa right um, so you could have contract accountant with lofting staff and services and then in your bullet you could say um, managed accounting functions for these organizations um, if you wanted to so you could do it in a variety of ways in this in the header of the experience by indicating the companies that you are contracted to or in the descriptive bullet um, or first sentence. I hope that answers the question. Great. And one of the um, formatting things you had said was no picture. So somebody had asked, um, what about adding your professional LinkedIn picture to the top of your resume, but only on the first page? Yeah, we generally say no pictures on the resume just takes up space. Okay, great. And then I think um, just in case this one wasn't a, somebody who came in late, um, how should relevant volunteer experience be leveraged on the resume? Yeah, so um, 
your your section headers right so if I'm, if I'm this resume says professional experience military experience education um, you really can choose what those headers say so you could um, title the first section relevant experience and that could be both paid and volunteer experiences that you have that might be really relevant to the job that you're applying for um, or you could have a volunteer you could have a volunteer experience and a professional experience section sometimes um, especially for people um, who've had like um, kind of a, a winding path if that makes sense so maybe they worked in sales five years ago and then they were in education and then they did something else and then now they're back in sales and they're applying for another sales job that we could manipulate the format by having a very specific section header that says sales experience so that you're taking those um, smatterings of related experiences out of the holistic chronological order but because you're in that specific section then you're telling the reader here are my related sales experiences so the section header is really the key to manipulating the format and how you weave volunteer experience, whether that's explicitly through its own section or within the um, related um, either generic or explicit experience sections is kind of up to you. Great. And then another one is I have seen some resumes that have very unusual formatting. Do you think that that unusual formatting is a hindrance or a help? Yeah, it just kind of depends. Um, so if you're in a creative field like advertising or graphic design, then your resume probably shouldn't look like the example on the screen, right? Because they want to see your designed resume. Um, the thing to consider is that sometimes these um, untraditional, unusual formatting, especially if it's gone to a, a large organization that um, has an applicant tracking system, um, sometimes it's hard for that computer system to navigate that formatting and really get the information. So um, what you wanna consider is does the formatting fit with my industry and field that I'm sending it to, right? So if it's like designed and artsy and all of that good stuff and you're applying to be a coordinator in the career center, well, that's a misalignment, right? Um, but if you're applying to be a graphic designer at Lamar Advertising, that's probably great. Um, and then secondly, can the reader within 15 to 20 seconds easily get the information that they need? Can they, what's important to them? Can they get that information? Because it's more than the visual, the content to prove that the company would be making a smart business decision and giving you an interview is really what the reader is most concerned with. And so, as long as the formatting is uh, easy to digest and um, professional and um, you can get the, the information pretty quickly, you don't have to search for it, um, then I think it's, it's up to the um, writer and figuring out what they think is best based on the company and the industry they're applying for. Great. So another question that came through is um, with the toolbox and everything you list in the toolbox, um, you're supposed to edit that when it comes to your resume. What about your LinkedIn profile? Are you supposed to add all of that to your LinkedIn profile? Yeah. The, the beautiful thing about LinkedIn is that you can add everything. Um, and so, you know, why not? I guess um, LinkedIn, you know, it's it's powered through AI type framework, right? So the more information that um, LinkedIn has, the better it can cultivate, you know, jobs that you might be interested in. The, the more you'll be pulled up in a variety of searches that HR recruiters may have. So, um, you know, I think from a LinkedIn perspective, the more information, the better in terms of the return that you would get from LinkedIn. 
Okay, great. And then question on behalf of my student workers that are about <laughs> to graduate in the next month, um, they've been working on campus with, for the past three years and encourage them to keep a toolbox of everything that they've done to utilize in the future. However, their resumes are definitely super short experience wise. How would you, what would you recommend for that? Yeah, um, so I think that um, your students, if um, you know, we could sit down with them one on one, talk with them with a career coach in our office, they'd probably find that they have more experience than they realize, right? Clubs and organizations, student leadership, their part time on campus jobs, summer jobs, maybe even project work in school. But on, on Eddie's sample resume that's on our screen right now, we really like stretch this formatting to the max to um, put, you know, 10 plus years of both professional and military experience onto a document. We don't have to max out the formatting like that, right, for, for people with less experience. So um, in general, some of the rules is uh, you would want a minimum margin of half an inch on the sides and bottoms, but for a student who maybe doesn't have a lot of experience, we could make that 0.75 or even one inch, right? So have less, um, use less of the page, if you will, so that the content uses more of the page. We could also play with how we format um, the, the experience headers instead of all putting it on one line using multiple lines for that information so that takes up more um, the font um, uh, minimum font size could if you had to go down to a 10 11 is probably better um, but you could go up to a 12 and so you could use like a aerial font at a 12 and that takes up more room than times new roman at a 10 right um, and so there are ways to kind of fill the page but, you know, filling the page with good um, ex examples of your experiences, whether that's paid or unpaid, um, is really the most important thing. And um, it would be good to talk with the student workers um, to make sure they're thinking about those eight career competencies. Because what we see in our office is that a lot of times when students are writing their resumes, they think about the very surface level, right? Um, so our student workers at the front desk might say, answer the phones, schedule meetings. But then when we, when we prod them a little bit and say like, well, remember how you have to solve those problems, right? When a student comes in and they have an issue and they say, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about writing this. Or remember how the six of you were put on a project to accomplish this task for our event. Oh yeah, well that's teamwork. Well, you should demonstrate that. And so um, sometimes it's just helping them reflect on um, the depth of their experience as well, because it's probably more than they realize. And what about adding uh, references to the one pager? Yeah, we generally um, advise that references are not needed on a resume. Uh, every company asks for references a different way. Um, and so some will ask you um, in the application um, to provide references and you type that into a form. Some won't even ask you for references until they're ready to make a hiring decision. And so it really just takes up space on an actual document. Um, where you're supposed to be talking about yourself. Um, on our job postings, we, in the application, we ask to please send us a resume, a cover letter, and three professional references. And we're looking for those references on a completely independent document. Um, and so it would be like one attachment with three documents or three different attachments in the application. So um, unless references are asked for explicitly in the application, then you can just hold on to them until they're ready because um, the company will ask for it when they need it. Okay, great. And to just be mindful of everybody's time, I think um, we can go ahead and finish out our presentation and then we have some more room for questions at the end for sure. Sure. Well, we do have on our website um, the LSU Student Career Guide. Now this is really tailored tailored at the um, traditional undergraduate population. But I think that 
Um, it does have good basic information about writing a resume. It talks about action verb statements. It gives the general format, section headings, et cetera. And so it might be a good resource. And then there is this resume template in a Word document that um, is just like one of the examples that you saw that will be available to you after the presentation. All right, and back to you, Courtney. Hey, and um, because I work with LSU Online, um, we wanted to just kind of put in some quick information for everybody who's joining us who's an online student. So we do have uh, our concierge service, which is unique to LSU Online. And so what the concierge service is there for is it is so that way you have support from application all the way through to graduation. So we have enrollment coordinators that will reach out to any of our students who are interested um, and kind of call them and go over some of the um, like just qualifying you, making sure that you fit the program that you're interested in, just get a couple of questions from you. From there, an enrollment concierge takes over and will help to answer additional questions for you, help you through that application process. And it's really just knowing that you have a point of contact on campus who can help you along the way. Know that we're only a phone call or an email away to answer those questions. We're always here to give you support. And then once you get admitted, um, the enrollment concierge team that I'm on, we send you over to a learner concierge who then works with the specific department that you are admitted into. They help with oh, I got locked out of my Moodle and I can't get in, or who do I reach out to for this? Um, and just once again, somebody who's there to help you through all of that. So um, they're with you, then your learner concierge is there with you all the way up until graduation. Um, so that's great. So somebody who you know on campus who can always have access to. Um, and so then going on to the next slide, um, we have just a listing. If Jesse, I think you'll have to move me to the next slide. Um, but we have just a listing of the uh, programs that we offer. So we offer through LSU Online, we have master's degree level, we have bachelor's, we have associate degrees, we have graduate level certificates, um, and we also have micro um, credentials. And these are through LSU Baton Rouge, but also our partner campuses in Alexandria, Eunice, and Shreveport as well. So you can always reach out to us if any of these um, are of interest to you. We'll be happy to answer questions. And then the next page talks about our prior learning assessment or our PLA options um, that we have as well. If you wanted to move to that slide, Jesse, um, it lists, this would be very important to have listed on your resume because the PLA options are a way to use credentials that you've learned or that you've got in the past and turn it into college credits. So over here on the right hand side of this, we uh, have uh, listings. So like, for instance, if you have a project management or a PMP uh, professional, there are certain uh, graduate level programs that that can be used for college credit and it, it takes the place of some of the coursework that you have. So it shortens the time that you have, it saves money. Um, so prior learning assessments is awesome and something we're trying to get most of our programs to have options for. So that being listed on your resume would definitely help as your enrollment concierge to trigger and be like, hey, we could use this as credit for you. So um, that's always great to have that on your resume as well. And then also certain micro-credentials um, programs are eligible where you can take micro-credentials with us or micro-creds, which is a smaller, um, it's normally four to five uh, classes that you take and you earn a certificate. And those can also be turned into credit as well. Um, so those are just some options for you. Just wanted to do a quick and kind of let you guys know some of the things that LSU Online has to offer for you with that. Um, so yeah, so um, any other questions that we might have as well? Um, this next slide we just have kind of open for questions and then also Jesse and I's contact information if anybody has um, any questions with that. Oh, Jesse, I think you're muted. That I answered a few questions. Somebody asked about cover letters, and um, I sent a link in the chat um, okay. with our, our website that has a detailed cover letter. Um, the cover letter is really why you're writing um, explicitly stating the position in the company and um, then giving a couple of examples of why you think you would be a good fit. So doing that research 
is really important and maybe talking about the things that um, like the passion or your excitement for certain things or your interests that can't always be conveyed in a resume. The cover letter is also an opportunity to give information um, that could be helpful. So um, perhaps you are planning to move to the Houston area, right? And so when, whenever I get a job application and I see that the you know, applicant is from Iowa, I'm always like, hmm, why is someone from Iowa applying for jobs at LSU? Well, you know, I know it's a great place, but like you, that's rare. Um, and so, you know, if they were an applicant that we liked, we don't ever discredit them for that, but that's always a question that comes up. But sometimes, you know, um, we get in the cover letter, my spouse, you know, is being transferred to the Baton Rouge area. And so I'll be blah, blah, blah. And it's like, ah, that makes sense, right? This person is already moving here. If not, in our, if that person was a great candidate, that would, of course, be one of our questions. Like, tell us what interests you in LSU and Baton Rouge, right? Um, you realize it's hot down here. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, right? Um, so, uh, you know, those are some of the things that um, we've had people who've been out of the workforce for a while. Maybe they've been um, staying at home to raise children or taking care of elderly or sick family members. Um, and so they might state some of that, right? Because their resume might show a gap in employment. And so they might state that to like just take any guesses out about that um career changers right like um sometimes it's hard for a reader of a resume to make the jump of like why someone has been in sales for 15 years and now they want to be a teacher um so like telling a little bit of that story in um the cover letter helps us make sense of that as a reader um and, um, and so that's where the cover letter becomes really valuable. Awesome. Any recommendations for career changers? I think career changers um, really need to focus on transferable skills. So um, I've had my whole career in career services work. So I don't know what, I, I, don't, I can't even imagine changing careers. But if I did, what I know I wouldn't have to rely on is the fact that um, my leadership skills, my communication abilities, the fact that I've managed a team before, that I've set goals and had helped the team accomplish. Um, and if that was in a different environment, then I'd really be focusing on my transferable skills rather than the um, technical or the very specific task of my role in career services or my ex knowledge or expertise. I would focus on transferable skills. <clears throat> Great. Um, and so any questions that we have remaining, um, Jesse or myself, we can just like type them out. Um, but just to be mindful of everybody's time, um, we are getting pretty close to the end. So I just want to thank everybody who joined us today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we had some really awesome questions. Um, and I really want to thank Jesse as well for joining us and joining Thanks for us having online. Me. Yeah. It's a, help some of our um, incoming students, current students, uh, potential students, um, returning students, um, and all of this. And we, we greatly appreciate everybody who joined us today. So thank you guys so very much. All right. Have a good one. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Have a great one.